What is sepsis and what is septic shock? How do you define it? How do you screen for it? What are the risk factors? We're gonna crush it all today at Citizen Surgeon. Welcome back to Citizen Surgeon. If you're looking for an amazing resource to learn surgery, be comfortable on the ward and the ICU, and of course crush your exams and you've come to the right spot, go ahead, subscribe, turn on your notifications so you can know when the next video is coming out. Today, we are gonna be talking about sepsis. Is there a bigger topic in surgery? Probably not. This is something that as a general surgeon, you're gonna deal with every single day. Whether it's treating a septic patient in the ER or the ICU and finding a solution, or if you're looking at post-operative complications. Sepsis is absolutely fundamental to surgery. I think after today, you're gonna to have a lot of confidence in how to approach this huge subject. Why is it important to know sepsis? Just like I said, take that seven-year-old who presents to the ED with abdominal pain. He's tachycardic, has involuntary guarding in the right lower quadrant. How are you gonna know if he's septic and needs resuscitation? Take that post-operative patient who comes back and you're thinking that he has an anastomotic leak. How are you gonna approach that? How are you gonna treat that patient? So let's talk about it with a clinical example. We're gonna go over it now, and then at the end of the video, we're going to go over it again and make sure we learn all the components of sepsis. So you have a 68-year-old male that presents five days after a low anterior resection for rectal cancer. He's got abdominal pain, fever, and involuntary guarding in the left lower quadrant. He has a little bit of confusion. His white cell count's elevated. What are you gonna do now? What are the risk factors for sepsis in this patient? How do you screen for sepsis in this patient? What do you need to accomplish in the first hour with this patient? And ultimately, how are you gonna treat them? So sepsis is a huge topic. I think if you master sepsis, you can save lives. Think about it, over 50 million cases a year, 11 million deaths. Sepsis is responsible for 20% of all deaths and it's on the rise. With an aging population, the greatest incidence of sepsis is in those over 65. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of how big this topic is. The three references today are number one, the surviving sepsis guidelines. You're gonna find this in the description. Number two is gonna be Savistin's textbook of surgery. And number three is Norton's surgery textbook. All of these are golden references. Surviving sepsis guidelines is just something you need to review time and time again. The Norton book is gonna give you that basic science overview, and Savistin's is gonna hit the clinical bullet points. So let's go ahead and find out how do we define sepsis. So sepsis is defined as a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection. So what's septic shock? Septic shock is sepsis, with circulatory and cellular or metabolic dysfunction associated with a higher risk of mortality. Septic shock is also a patient with sepsis who requires vasoactive medications to keep the mean arterial pressure over 65 millimeters mercury and a lactate is greater than two millimoles per liter. So let's get into some causes. If you haven't had a chance to check out my last video on shock, go ahead, check that out. Make sure you have a solid foundation for how to recognize and treat shock because septic shock is a subset of shock, part of the distributive shock. So make sure you're comfortable with the shock lecture. So what are the most common pathogens when it comes to sepsis? Well, gram positive are the most common. So think of Staph aureus, MRSA or methicillin resistant Staph aureus and Streptococcus. In surgery, we see a lot of gram negative sepsis. So gram negatives would be like E. coli or Klebsiella. And then, of course, fungal sepsis has a very high risk of mortality, and this could be like invasive candidiasis. It's also important to recognize that in 15% of cases or more than that, no organism can be identified in a patient with sepsis. And then, of course, polymicrobial infections in appendicitis. Sometimes when we do cultures, we'll see that not only does E. coli grow, but Enterococcus grows, Klebsiella grows, Pseudomonas grows. So polymicrobial infections are common. And we'll talk about when we start to do antibiotic therapy, you have to be thoughtful about thinking about polymicrobial infections, especially when you're treating empirically. There are two other things to keep in mind, and that's the effect of endotoxin and superantigens. So endotoxin, this is something that's present on the bacteria. And this is lipopolysaccharide. 
and it's a component of the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria. The host response to lipopolysaccharide is what causes damage. And in this scenario, lipopolysaccharide, or LPS, binds to lipopolysaccharide binding protein, which is activated through toll-like receptor 4. That's a, point that might, that's a point that may be important for your exams. This leads to excessive activation of the innate immune system, and that is responsible for the pathogenesis of early septic shock. When we look at superantigens, that's another component of bacteria that are really important. So streptococci, staphylococcus, and others have this superantigen, and what it does is instead of the conventional APC processing pathway, we talked about a little bit in the metabolic response to injury, this activates large numbers of CD4 cells. And instead of having conventional processing, a bridge is formed between CD4 T helper cells with antigen presenting cells, and it results in large uncontrolled activation. So when you're thinking about the pathogen involved and you're thinking about empiric coverage, your patients are gonna give you clues. So if you have a patient that is status post lumpectomy for a breast cancer who presents with a red, swollen, tender breast and a fever, that spectrum of pathogen might be different than a neonate with necrotizing enteric colitis. So you can think about the patient, the operation they had, the age of the patient, and that'll give you clues to the pathogens. In addition, we can start thinking about what organ is causing this. And you do that through a careful history and physical exam. So different organs are gonna have different pathogens. The lung is gonna be a little bit different than the colon, which is gonna be a little bit different than the brain or the urinary tract. So definitely keep this in mind when you're taking your history and doing your physical exam. There are a lot of risk factors. So age is a risk factor, immunosuppression, a history of cancer, obesity, diabetes, previous hospitalization, having bacteremia, and of course, community-acquired pneumonia. These are all risk factors for having sepsis. And so now we get to screening. And there are a bunch of different screening calculators and methods. I'm going to give you an introduction of three here. And one, you should know pretty well. So we have three. We have SIRS, we have QSOFA, which is a shortened form or abbreviated form of SOFA, and then we have NEWS. All right, so let's take SIRS. That's the Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome. QSOFA is the Quick Sequential Organ Failure Assessment, and NEWS is the National Early Warning Score. So SIRS, or Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome, used to be a popular way that we could diagnose sepsis. And so you look at the respiratory rate, the heart rate, the white cell count, and the temperature. And if you have two or more of these criteria, then you can say that somebody has systemic inflammatory response syndrome. So what's sepsis? Sepsis would be SIRS plus a source of infection. And so septic shock would be SIRS plus a source of infection plus circulatory failure. One of the problems with using SIRS as a screening criteria for sepsis is that many things that are not sepsis can also give you SIRS. So take pancreatitis. Pancreatitis is not necessarily an infection of the pancreas, it's inflammation. And so SIRS really gives you inflammation instead of infection. So let's check out QSOFA. You might not have heard about this one. So QSOFA is a score that's used outside of the ICU, and this is shown to be superior to SIRS for screening for sepsis. So the quick sequential organ failure assessment looks at three simple things to screen for sepsis. And so if you have an increased respiratory rate, altered mentation, or a systolic blood pressure that's less than 100, and if you have more than two of these, then your risk of a bad outcome due to sepsis is high. I won't get too much into the weeds on news, it's just important that you're aware of it. So let's get over to evaluation and treatment. So you have that patient, you're worried about sepsis. They've hit your screening criteria for sepsis, and you, now you need to evaluate and treat. A lot of people say, I'm gonna start with the history. But in reality, I want you to think of two things. Think of supplemental oxygen and IV access. Make sure the patient's ABCs, or airway breathing circulation, are taken care of, and then get into your history and physical exam. 
With the history, you've got to ask good questions. Do they have risk factors for sepsis? What's their age? What's their surgical history? What's their medical history? What are their comorbidities? Are they taking any medications you should be worried about? When you're doing your physical exam, sepsis is actually a really good acronym. So sepsis stands for shivering, extreme pain. Are they sleepy or do they have altered mentation? Are they saying something like, I feel like I might die? And then of course, do they have shortness of breath? That's a feature of both QSOFA and SIRS. After you've done a history and physical exam, it's important to get some baseline labs. So these labs will really give you an idea of what's happening across the body. The CBC is going to give you an evaluation of do they have a high or a low white cell count. A low white cell count below four is going to make me even more worried about that patient. The hemoglobin is going to give you an idea if they have anemia. Platelets sometimes can be very low, especially in a neonate with necrotizing enteric colitis. Those platelets drop as the sepsis gets worse. A full chem panel will give you an idea of what's happening with the electrolytes, help guide resuscitation. D-dimer, lactate, CRP, and procalcitonin are other labs that we're going to talk about, and they're important to get as well for a baseline set. In addition to drawing your labs, you want to make sure that you get two sets of blood cultures. And then when we're looking at our acid base status, an ABG or an arterial blood gas can be extremely helpful. And then think about imaging. Imaging is going to be related to what organ system you think is involved. Do they just need a plain x-ray of the abdomen or a chest to diagnose a pneumonia? Or do they need a CT scan to give you some more information about what's happening in the abdominal cavity? Now I want to take you into how to start treatment. And this is where I want you to refer to the surviving sepsis guidelines. I have a link in the description down below to the PDF, and this is absolute gold. The surviving sepsis guidelines and the surviving sepsis campaign have one major premise, and that is that sepsis and septic shock are medical emergencies and need to be treated as such. There is a one hour bundle of goals that you need to accomplish within 60 minutes. And that is number one, when you're getting your labs, you want to measure the lactate level, obtain blood cultures, and administer broad spectrum antibiotics. The antibiotics should be administered after you get that set of blood cultures. You're also going to want to deliver 30 mils per kilo of crystalloid for hypotension or lactate greater than four. And if you need to, apply vasoactive medications, which we're going to talk about, to target a mean arterial pressure of greater than 65. All of these elements may not finish within the hour, but should be started and complete within three hours. That's the goal. Early goal-directed therapy is a topic of conversation. Early goal-directed therapy is really the protocolized resuscitation guided by particular endpoints. Some of those endpoints are central venous pressure or mean arterial pressure or central venous oxygen saturations. The endpoints of resuscitation continue to be a matter of debate. There are a lot of trials that discuss early goal-directed therapy. Some of these are the PROCESS trial, the PROMISE trial, or the ARISE trial. I'll put links to those in the description below. However, one thing that all the trials agree on is in that patient with septic shock, you need to resuscitate with 30 mils per kilo of crystalloid solution within the first three hours of diagnosis. So when it comes to antibiotics, the one thing I'm gonna say is be thoughtful. I'm not gonna go through every antibiotic regimen, but you need to be thoughtful about what antibiotics you're applying. Go back and think about the pathogens. Do you have an antibiotic map in your hospital? Are there resistance patterns? What surgery and what organ did you operate on? What are the comorbidities? What's the immune status? How about the age? And of course, are there any devices in the patient? This is gonna give you an idea about what antibiotics you should start with. The four important concepts I want you to take away with antibiotics are number one, broad spectrum, the right dose, the right duration, and de-escalation when they're no longer necessary. The antibiotic regimen that you choose, and this is a great paper, another link in the description below, has a dramatic effect. If you miss the antibiotic and you miss the pathogen, survival goes down by fivefold. So it's really important that you cover the right pathogen with the right antibiotic. So in surgery, what do we like to do? We like to get source control. So think about source control. Do you need to drain an abscess? Do you need to debride necrosis like in necrotizing fasciitis? 
Do you need to think about removing a device? Is this a catheter associated UTI or is this an infection of a central line? Then of course there's surgical control. So is this a patient with diverticulitis or appendicitis or a perforated duodenal ulcer? All that is gonna be guided by that history, physical exam and workup. Now what I'd like to do is get a little bit into vasoactive medications. This can be a little confusing, but I'm gonna teach it to you with an alpha beta meter. If you haven't seen this before, I think you're gonna love it. If you need to add a vasoactive medication to augment your mean arterial pressure, you wanna start with norepinephrine. If that isn't enough, you can add on vasopressin, then you can go with dobutamine. But let's go ahead and look at each of the different vasoactive medications and how they relate to your alpha stimulation versus beta stimulation. So here you can see the alpha beta meter. On screen left is alpha, and you can say that on screen right is beta. Whatever medication you choose, they usually have an effect on either one of these receptors, and of course, of a lot of times, a combination of both. So remember that alpha-1 leads to vasoconstriction. Alpha-2 is smooth muscle and has mixed effects. Beta-1 is chronotropy and inotropy, so speeding up the heart rate as well as providing more squeeze. And of course, beta-2 is muscle relaxation. So the first one, let's take phenylephrine. So what is phenylephrine? So phenylephrine is pure alpha. That's gonna give you a dramatic increase in your systemic vascular resistance. Next, we'll do the opposite of that. So isopril or isoprenaline, this is gonna be pure beta. And this is gonna give you that increased heart rate, that increased squeeze. Epinephrine sits in the middle, so that's gonna activate all of the alpha and beta receptors it's gonna give you a major effect on increasing the workload of the heart and your cardiac output and cardiac index. If we look at norepinephrine, that's gonna be more alpha one, alpha two, and that's where you get that nice squeeze needed to treat someone in septic shock after they've been resuscitated. And then dobutamine, like we talked about before, this is gonna give you that beta action. So I hope that alpha beta meter gives you a nice perspective on the different vasoactive medications and how they would be useful in different types of shock. So some other concepts that are really important. So one is corticosteroids. So when do you use corticosteroids? So corticosteroids can be used in septic shock that is resistant to fluids and vasoactive medications. Blood transfusion is a huge topic and typically blood is not needed to be transfused. There's good evidence for this until the hemoglobin falls below seven. Mechanical ventilation, another huge topic. If you want to avoid lung injury, then you want to ventilate with lower tidal volumes, right around six mils per kilo, and a plateau pressure of less than 30 centimeters water. As we've seen with COVID sepsis and sepsis in general, prone positioning can also be quite helpful. But there are a ton of other concepts. So whether that's thinking about venous thromboembolism prophylaxis or your sugar control, also preventing against stress alters, thinking about nutrition, thinking about the position of the patient. All of these come into play within septic shock. And if you read the surviving sepsis guidelines, as well as the other references, you're gonna have a good confidence when it comes to treating sepsis. So let's get back to that patient. So you got that 68 year old patient who now you've found is in sepsis, maybe even septic shock. So what risk factors did they have? So age, cancer, those are two good risk factors. They also had a major operation. How did you screen for this? So if we use QSOFA, you can see that we're gonna hit a couple of those points and we have a patient that has a risk of a poor outcome. What do you need to accomplish in that first hour? Go back, review that one hour bundle for the surviving sepsis guidelines. So did we accomplish our goals today? This is the list of questions you should be really comfortable with. So go through this, go back through the video. I'm gonna put all the timestamps in and I hope you feel really good about this topic. All right, I hope you enjoyed that talk on sepsis. Again, if you haven't subscribed, subscribe, leave a comment, and I will get back to you. I love engaging with you guys. And then, of course, you can check out citizensurgeon.com. Sign up for the newsletter. Every Saturday, I'm going to be putting out what I call the Saturday Six, or six things that I've learned this week. Upcoming, we got a surgeon book club that I want to get started. And, of course, we're going to start doing some webinars. So, anyway, look forward to seeing you in the comments. Engage with me and keep crushing it. Be safe, be healthy.